A wise, young, and probably lonely mathematician in the 1700s created an incredibly famous game, which I'd like to play with you. He said we're going to create an infinite triangle, and we're going to divide this triangle into a set of equally spaced rows. Within each row, we will divide it into a certain number of boxes, and it will be exactly one more box than the row above it, with the first row only having a single box. Next, every box which touches the edge of the triangle will have a 1 inside of it. Now that we have the frame for the triangle, we can start to list the rules. The first rule is that every box must have a number inside of it. The second one is that the number generated is produced by adding the two numbers directly above it. For example, the missing box on the second row is produced by adding the two ones above it. Similarly, on the third row we can see that the numbers generated are from 1 plus 2 and then 2 plus 1. Hopefully now we can see how the rest of the triangle is produced, so I will fill out the next couple rows using the same ideas. Although we can only see the first seven rows, these are the fundamentals for the famous concept and the basis of this video, Pascal's Triangle. This video all stemmed from a completely random thought I had years ago, and was something which I almost neglected trying to solve. The method used in this video is an idea unlike anything I've seen in pure maths, and has a large involvement with visual ideas rather than algebraic reasoning like everything else. As we will see later, I think the ideas and concepts we discover are not only unbelievably cool, but also elegant and quite accessible. Also, the last part of this video is probably going to be the best part of the entire thing. I'm going to explore some of the extremely abstract concepts, with one of them being one of my personal ideas, which delves into hyperpyramids and pentacorons, which already sounds so cool. Honestly, it sounds like complete gibberish, and realistically, it probably is, but somehow it works, and later you'll feel incredibly confused, but hopefully slightly smarter. With that, let's begin. Like in my other videos, we're going to start by asking a seemingly unrelated problem. How do we expand x plus y to a given power? I will manually expand and simplify these brackets for the first couple terms, but the more important idea is that we're not going to keep manually doing this, but rather look for a trend. The first thing that will be blatant to many of you is that the coefficients of the terms produce Pascal's triangle which is something which shows up so naturally. This is the fundamental component in generating these sequences, and is something which is so easily connected with Pascal's triangle. The next trend is slightly harder to see, so I'm going to rewrite the expansion slightly differently. Can you notice anything? The first thing is that in a given row, the sum of the powers of the variables add up to the power of the expansion. The second thing which is harder to see is that starting from the left, the powers of y increase from 0 to n, and the powers of x decrease from n to 0. So, that seemed easy enough. I'm sure many of you could now easily solve x plus y to the 7, or 8, or 10. The important thing is that we also need to generalise this, for a reason we'll see later. My first claim to do this is that in the expansion of x plus y to the n, it is given by this expansion, which is an idea that we just saw. Something important is that we can't forget the coefficient c, which is what we get from Pascal's triangle. We can see that for x plus y to the 5, using this method, we can get the general form. Now substituting our values from Pascal's triangle, we can see that this is the exact same value that we got from before. We can write the general form for x plus y to the 7, and generate the 8th row of Pascal's triangle and substitute it in. But what about for the expansion of x plus y to the 20, or x plus y to the 50? It becomes more and more unrealistic to manually generate each row of Pascal's triangle. And for x to the y to small powers, Pascal's triangle is useful, but for larger powers we can use a different technique. And that technique is this formula. Unfortunately, the point of this video is not deriving this, although this proof is quite straightforward, so I'll skip it. But this formula is commonly given in formula books and generates each coefficient 
of each term and is aptly called the binomial coefficient. For those of you who haven't seen this, in the background I will show you how this formula is used to generate the coefficients. In the formula, n is the overall power which x plus y is raised to, and k is the power of x or y, in this case I used y. We can see that we just substitute n for 7, which is constant, and then vary k, which generates the terms in the expansion. And sure enough, this produces the expansion we want. If any of you want to test this, you can produce the eighth row of Pascal's triangle and prove this. We can use this again for the expansion of x plus y to the 50, and the binomial coefficient of y squared is 1225. If any of you are bored enough to actually write this out for every single row up to row 51, you'll actually see this is true. This is the basis for the binomial expansion. But here is the point of the video. How do we expand x plus y plus z to the n? I'm going to start by redrawing Pascal's triangle to remind us what it looks like, but now we can get rid of it. Rather than drawing a triangle, I'm going to draw a pyramid. Although this pyramid is finite, imagine that it continues to expand downwards infinitely. Similar to before, we're going to draw an infinite number of equally spaced rows, although now the rows are planes. Similar to in Pascal's triangle, all we're going to consider are these rows where we have the numbers and the gaps in between aren't used. To make this easier, rather than modelling in 3D, we're going to write this in 2D, and we're going to consider each triangle at each cross-section. And in the same way that we could have written Pascal's triangle row by row, we're going to write Pascal's pyramid cross-section by cross-section. Throughout the next part, remember that we're looking down from the top of the pyramid like this, where we can see each triangle is equilateral and growing in size. The top vertex is essentially the first row, and as in Pascal's triangle, will just be one. We know that Pascal's pyramid grows in size, so rather than each cross section having an extra number, it will have an extra row. And again, similar to Pascal's triangle, each point at the edge of the cross section will be one. I'm going to color code the sides of the triangle for a reason we'll see later. So this is the second cross section of Pascal's pyramid. Using this, we can generate the third one. We know we'll have three rows now. We can change the corners to ones. Next, we can add up all of the terms which are directly above it, which is slightly hard to visualize, so I'll highlight which numbers we're going to use. I'm going to start showing the cross sections from left to right to give us more space to work with, but remember, we're still going to be looking from the top down of the pyramid. As we generate the fourth one, we can use the same technique, but something interesting happens in the middle. As there are three numbers directly above it, the number in the middle is all three numbers added together, which is six. For the final example, the fifth triangle, we want to start by placing the ones. We can create the sides of the triangle in the same way that we had before. Something I want to mention, which you might have already noticed, is that the side of each of the triangles is actually the same as the row from Pascal's triangle. This is really hard to visualize and honestly doesn't serve much of a purpose, but I think it's a really cool feature of the pyramid. Now that we know how to generate Pascal's pyramid, we can go back to the original question. How do we expand x plus y plus z to the n? Similar to before, we're going to start by expanding the first couple sets of x plus y plus z to the n. Next, for no reason, I'm going to color code some of the values. After this, I'm going to rearrange them to a certain format too. I'm also going to write out the expansion of x plus y plus z to the 3. Now we can start looking for trends again. Almost magically, we can see the natural formation of Pascal's pyramid. I think the most elegant part of all of this is how organically it appears. It takes such a small amount of work to show how fundamentally it lies. Regardless, to see the other trends, we're just going to look at x plus y plus z to the 3. The first thing that we can notice again is that we can see Pascal's pyramid is here. 
The next feature is that from each corner, the variable at the corner is the greatest. And for each row away that we move, the power decreases by one. Let me show you what I mean. Starting from the top, we have x cubed. And as we move down by one, we have x squared. And then again, when we move down, we only have x. And finally, we have x to the zero, which is just one. Starting from the bottom left, we start at y cubed, and we see the same trend. Finally, starting from the bottom right, where we have z cubed, we see the same trend again. This method is quite simple, although I think it's quite elegant in how it forms. To see how this can be used, we can generate the next cross section, x plus y plus z to the 4. We start by writing the fifth cross section in Pascal's triangle. We can draw the lines and then begin writing our powers of x. We have the staircasing effect, where we start at x to the 4, and every row we go down we decrease by 1, which is the same as we did before. Although I don't show you the lines, I repeated the process from the bottom left for the powers of y, and from the bottom right for the powers of z. The final result we get is the expansion, and again, feel free to expand these brackets yourself and prove this is the result, but expanding this might take a while. And this is it, the trinomial expansion, the primary focus of my video. I hope it was clear and interesting, although this last section will likely be some of the hardest to understand, yet the coolest features which arise from the stuff we've learnt. I will start with the most common usage, which is the binomial distribution. This stems from the binomial expansion and is used absolutely everywhere. It essentially says that if we flip the coin 10 times, around 25% of the time you'll get 5 heads and 5 tails, but a decent proportion of the time you'll get a combination of 4 and 6 or even 3 and 7. This concept is so fundamental in statistics, but has interesting roots in the binomial expansion. Next, as it follows on, the trinomial distribution. Most of you have likely never seen this before, since it's unnecessarily hard to understand. Let's just say that they show that the chance of winning rock, paper, scissors is 20%, and losing is 30%, and drawing is 50%. At a given point, it shows the likelihood that in 10 games, you get the number of wins, which is outcome 1, the number of losses, which is outcome 2, and then 10 minus the number of wins and the number of losses, which is the number of draws. For example, at the greatest peak that we can see, it's saying that roughly 10% of the time, in the 10 games of rock, paper, scissors, with those odds, you will win 2, lose 3, and then draw 5, which is exactly what you'd expect, since the probabilities were 20%, 30%, and 50%. Here it is the final and absolute best section, and it's about what I like to call Vix's pentacoron, which is a 4D tetrahedron. I've searched across the entire internet to see if anybody else has tried this before, but from what I can tell, I am one of the first, if not the first, to try this. Since there's no actual language to describe this, I'm just going to make some stuff up. The principle of this is that in Pascal's triangle, you can squish it into one row, in theory, and make it 1D. In Pascal's pyramid, we can take the cross-sectional areas and make it 2D. In Vix's pentacoron, we take the cross-sectional volumes, which is really difficult to visualize, but essentially, we never need the 4D shape. Using some overarching trends which we can see, we can actually predict how the cross-sectional volume will grow. Let me show you. And let's ask the question of, how do you expand W plus X plus Y plus Z to the N? Since this is incredibly hard to visualize and use, I'm not going to code this and instead I'm going to draw on a whiteboard. We can start at the top by saying the first one will be a 1 and just 1, which is always true no matter how many dimensions that we have. For the next one, again we can start with 1s on each corner, like this. So we can label a 1 there, a 1 here, a 1 here, and a 1 here. After this, we're going to start with, again, ones in each corner, since this is always true. The important thing here is that we can begin labeling between the vertices. For example, we can put a two here, we can put a two here, a two here, a two here, a two here, and a two here. 
for the final one, I'm just going to draw this and show you the solution because this is unbelievably hard to draw and to visualize. And at the end of this, we get this shape. And it's so hard to see, but you might be able to see that each face of this is actually from Pascal's pyramid. And then again, you can see that across each edge, we have Pascal's triangle. But how does this all link to Vix's pentacron? For the first one, we don't need to change this as all of the powers are zero. For the next one, we would start labeling these with the variables. So we can start with a W here. We can put our X here, our Y here, and our Z in the corner. This next part is where it starts to get a bit hard to draw. We start by labeling each of the corners with the squared terms. And after this, rather than drawing lines, we start by drawing planes. So the first plane will go across like this, and the second one will go over the top like that. We can start with W squared, and then decrease the power here so we have the Ws, and then finally, these will all be W to the zero. We can do this again, and we can repeat this for Z. We can start in the bottom right, we can draw a line like this, we can draw our second line, which represents a plane across like that. And now we add our powers of Z here, here, and here. If you continue to do this, eventually you'll get this, which is the expansion for W plus X plus Y plus Z, all to the power of two. I'm going to stop here, but more than anything, I think it's so interesting that this even works. The main takeaway that I want you to have from this video is to test what if. All of this research was actually stuff which I figured out myself. And aside from the very last section, although somebody else had explained it before, it felt so good to follow through and see if a hypothesis worked out. This video has been by far the longest to create. And to the person in the comment section who's going to ask what about the quadnomial distribution, all I ask is please let me sleep. If you enjoyed, please like, comment and subscribe, and feel free to ask any questions. Thanks. Thank you.